The bells of St. Mark's were ringing changes up on the mountain when Bud skated over to the mod parlor to upgrade his skull gun. Bud had a nice new pair of blades with a top speed of anywhere from 100 to 150 kilometers, depending on how fat you were and whether or not you wore arrow. Bud liked wearing skin-tight leather to show off his muscles. On a previous visit to the mod parlor two years ago, he had paid to have a bunch of sights implanted in his muscles, little critters, too small to see or feel, that twitched Bud's muscle fibers electrically, according to a program that was supposed to maximize bulk. Combined with the testosterone pump embedded in his forearm, it was like working out in a gym night and day, except you didn't have to actually do anything, and you never got sweaty. The only drawback was that all the little twitches made him kind of tense and jerky. He'd gotten used to it, but it still made him a little hinky on those skates, especially when he was doing a hundred clicks an hour through a crowded street. But few people hassled Bud, even when he knocked them down in the street, and after today, no one would hassle him ever again. Bud had walked away, improbably unscratched, from his last job, decoy, with something like a thousand yooks in his pocket. He'd spent a third of it on new clothes, mostly black leather, another third of it on the blades, and was about to spend the last third at the mod parlor. You could get skull guns a lot cheaper, of course, but that would mean going over the causeway to Shanghai and getting a back alley job from some coaster, and probably a nice bone infection in with the bargain. And he'd probably pick your pocket while he had you seized. Besides, you could only get into a Shanghai if you were virgin. To cross the causeway when you were already packing a skull gun like Bud, you had to bribe the shit out of numerous Shanghai cops. There was no reason to economize here. Bud had a rich and boundless career ahead of him, vaulting up a hierarchy of extremely dangerous drug-related occupations for which decoy served as a paid audition of sorts. A start weapon system was a wise investment. The damn bells kept ringing through the fog. Bud mumbled a command to his music system, a phased acoustical array splayed across both eardrums like the seeds on a strawberry. The volume went up, but couldn't scour away the deep tones of the carillon, which resonated in his long bones. He wondered whether, as long as he was at the mod parlor, he should have the batteries drilled out of his right mastoid and replaced. Supposedly they were ten-year jobs, but he'd had them for six, and he listened to music all the time, loud. Three people were waiting. Bud took a seat and skimmed a Mediatron from the coffee table. It looked exactly like a dirty, wrinkled blank sheet of paper. Annals of self-protection, he said, loud enough for everyone else in the place to hear him. The logo of his favorite Mead feed coalesced on the page. Mediaglyphics, mostly the cool animated ones, arranged themselves in a grid. Bud scanned through them until he found the one that denoted a comparison of a bunch of different stuff and snapped at it with his fingernail. New mediaglyphics appeared, surrounding larger cine panes in which Annals staff tested several models of skull guns against live and dead targets. Bud frisbeed the Mediatron back onto the table. This was the same review he'd been poring over for the last day. They hadn't updated it. His decision was still valid. One of the guys ahead of him got a tattoo, which took about ten seconds. The other guy just wanted his skull gun reloaded, which didn't take much longer. The girl wanted a few sights replaced in her racting grid, mostly around her eyes where she was starting to wrinkle up. That took a while, so Bud picked up the Mediatron again and went in a Ractive, his favorite, called Shut Up or Die. The mod artist wanted to see Bud's yokes before he installed the gun, which in other surroundings might have been construed as an insult, but was standard business practice here in the leased territories. When he was satisfied that this wasn't a stick-up, he seized Bud's forehead with a spray gun, scalped back a flap of skin, and pushed a machine mounted on a delicate robot arm like a dental tool over Bud's forehead. The arm homed in automatically on the old gun, moving with alarming speed and determination. Bud, who was a little jumpy at the best of times because of his muscle stimulators, flinched a little. But the robot arm was a hundred times faster than he was and plucked out the old gun unerringly. The proprietor was watching all of this on a screen and had nothing to do except narrate. The hole in your skull's kind of rough, so the machine is reaming it out to a larger bore. Okay, now here comes the new gun. A nasty popping sensation radiated through Bud's skull when the robot arm snapped in the new model. It reminded Bud of the days of his youth, when from time to time one of his playmates would shoot him in the head with a BB gun. He instantly developed a low headache. It's loaded with a hundred rounds of popcorn, the proprietor said, so you can test out the uvery. 
As soon as you're comfortable with it, I'll load it for real. He stapled the skin of Bud's forehead back together so it'd heal invisibly. You could pay the guy extra to leave a scar there on purpose, so everyone would know you were packing, but Bud had heard that some chicks didn't like it. Bud's relationship with the female sex was governed by a gallimaufry of primal impulses, dim suppositions, deranged theories, overheard scraps of conversation, half-remembered pieces of bad advice, and fragments of, no doubt, exaggerated anecdotes that amounted to rank superstition. In this case, it dictated that he should not request the scar. Besides, he had a nice collection of sights, not very tasteful sunglasses with crosshairs hutted into the lens on your dominant eye. They did wonders for marksmanship, and they were real obvious, too, so that everyone knew you didn't fuck with a man wearing sights. Give it a whirl, the guy said, and spun the chair around. It was a big old antique barber chair upholstered in swirly plastic. So Bud was facing a mannequin in the corner of the room. The mannequin had no face or hair and was speckled with little burn marks, as was the wall behind it. Status, Bud said, and felt the gun buzz lightly in response. Stand by, he said, and got another answering buzz. He turned his face squarely toward the mannequin. Hut, he said. He said it under his breath, through unmoving lips, but the gun heard it. He felt a slight recoil tapping his head back, and a startling pop sounded from the mannequin, accompanied by a flash of light on the wall up above its head. Bud's headache deepened, but he didn't care. This thing runs faster ammo, so you'll have to get used to aiming a tad lower, said the guy. So Bud tried it again, and this time popped the mannequin right in the neck. Great shot! That would have decapped him if you were using Hellfire, the guy said. Looks to me like you know what you're doing. But there's other options, too, and three magazines so you can run multiple ammos. I know, 